Get ready for the best school year yet with IXL, the ultimate online learning program for K-12. Whether it's homework help, grade improvement, or conquering new challenges, IXL guides your child every step of the way. IXL makes learning fun and engaging, and it's less than $10 per month. Say goodbye to costly tutoring. IXL provides comprehensive support at unbeatable value. Membership start at just $9.95 per month. Visit IXL.com today for an exclusive 20% off. Unlock your child's full potential. Visit IXL.com now. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who knows that it's demanding to defeat those evil machines. Here is the captain. Yeah, just call me Tom Morello. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week in the garage, we are very excited to be featuring Howdy Cloudy Hazy Session IPA from the good folks over at Tailgate Brewery in beautiful and always exciting Nashville, Tennessee. Howdy Cloudy by Tailgate is a New England style IPA with a lush aroma of tangerine and citrus fruits and a soft, cloudy body. ABV 4.5% delicious, crushable, and perfect for a very enjoyable summertime beer. Howdy Cloudy, garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's say howdy to some of our good garage friends, Captain. First up, we have a long distance cheers, mate, that goes out to Gav in Adelaide, Australia. And a big We Like You jib goes out to Cindy in Peterborough, England. And last but certainly not least, we have Jen Vaughn from Queens, New York. Everyone we mentioned, they went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer run. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, beer run. We got some tank tops in the store, so check those out. They'll be here today, gone tomorrow. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is a very tragic case that we have to examine today. I know in all of these true crime stories, there are always questions left unanswered. Parts where we are often left to examine some information and draw our own conclusions. But this case may have more of those types of moments than other cases. But more than that, in this case, When you look at some of the information, instead, you find yourself asking time and time again why certain questions were not asked by others previously. Questions that should have been asked and alarms that should have been raised by those in power. People with authority at the local level. People that were elected, appointed, and paid handsome salaries and given local community privileges. These are people who were elected and appointed to be true leaders in their communities. Persons with the power to lead by example. Persons handed the responsibility and power to protect fellow members of their community. Most importantly, the power and the responsibility to protect the youth of their community. The children, our children. Officials with the ability to make a change and make a difference in their community. And if you are one of those officials 
who have been granted power, privilege, and responsibility, I, we, and so many others are asking you to make a change and to make a difference in this very difficult and tragic situation. Who will be the one to lead by example? So where we are often looking for answers in these real life and very true crime stories, this week, we are also looking for questions. We are looking for those who are decent enough to ask those questions. We are looking for someone brave enough to stand up and say, this is not right. We are looking for a champion. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the suspicious death investigation of 18-year-old Grant Solomon. Celebrating an 18th birthday is universally regarded as one of life's major milestones, with good reason. It is the age at which a person is first considered to have formally attained adulthood. Now, one can finally legally vote, marry, and serve in the military. So there is a lot of reasons to look forward to turning 18, to finally becoming an adult. But one of those reasons should not be to now have the ability to finally have the ability to petition the courts for custody of your little sister. And unfortunately, Captain, that is what we have here. This was the case for a young Grant Solomon who turned 18 years old. On June 13th, 2020, Grant Solomon legally became an adult, and Grant was hoping to convince the courts that he should have custody of his 14-year-old sister, Gracie. And why should this be? Grant and Gracie had been in the custody of their father, Aaron Solomon, for the past few years. Now, it is alleged that Gracie, again only 14, was being abused and had been being abused by her father for some time now. Grant, feeling like he was his sister's last line of defense, was eager to man up, literally, now that he had legally become an adult. He was hoping to testify in court as an adult against his father and, more importantly, get custody of his little sister granted to either his mother, Angie, or to himself. Definitely, there has to be a lot going wrong if an 18-year-old wants to take responsibility for their younger sister. The situation seems to be this, Captain, that the kids, Grant, his younger sister, wanted to go live with their mother. Their father was preventing that from happening. The courts were giving custody of the children to Aaron Solomon. And because the courts would not grant custody to Angie Solomon, his ex-wife, it is stated and reported that it was Grant's goal to, now that he's finally an adult, potentially take over the custody rights of his sister. And in fact, more importantly, testify in court that his father was abusing his little sister. Well, not just physically abusing her, but sexually abusing her as well. It's according to to the reports out there, this is alleged abuse on all fronts. And it goes without saying, but this is an incredibly serious situation. One that should not be the concern of a young man one who should be focused on his new adult life, school, college, and things of that nature. So 18th birthday cause for celebration in this case, yes and no. But that is not the only alleged crime in this week's story. No, because many have stated, and very publicly at that, what the captain's talking about. That at the center of this week's case, at the center of this entire story, is years of alleged abuse in all forms, verbal, mental, emotional, physical, and sexual, all leading to Grant's death that some are saying was a murder and many, many saying that at least this should be investigated in a thorough, proper investigation. 
Grant died in a suspicious and unlikely event that was termed an accident, an accident that may have only been witnessed by one person, Grant's father, Aaron Solomon. An air quotes accident of which the details of that supposed accident are provided to the world by the only eyewitness present, the allegedly abusive father. We'll get into the details of that day in question after we set this up a little bit more for you. Right, because many people are saying that these details of this situation do not match the photographic evidence available. Right. Details that are, again, suspicious and unlikely. So this is the story, a, a tragic story, of the 2020 suspicious death of a young man, 18-year-old Grant Solomon, who lived in Franklin, Tennessee. But the incident will take place in Gallatin, Tennessee. This is the kind of case, Captain, that I call a fence builder case. This incident and situation has built many fences over the last three years. On one side of the fence, you have those that say this is simply a very sad and very unfortunate accident. And then you have those on the other side of that fence that say, not so fast. This is an intentional homicide. We're going to start off just two guys in a garage walking a tightrope. The tightrope is that fence built by this incident and in separating a community. 18-year-old Grant Solomon was a popular and accomplished student athlete known for his intelligence, athletic prowess, and kind-hearted nature. Grant was a gifted dual athlete. He excelled especially in baseball and on the basketball court as well. In fact, he was garnering attention from Division I teams as a pitcher. Despite allegedly enduring years of abuse from his father, Grant remained an optimistic person, and he was very protective. He was very protective as a son and as a sibling. He had plans to testify against his father once he reached adulthood and hoped to gain custody of his little sister, Gracie, whom he also believed was suffering abuse by his father. Unfortunately, shortly after turning 18 years old, Grant met a tragic fate in what was officially ruled an accident, a vehicle accident. This is when his 2015 Toyota Tacoma pickup truck rolled backwards into a ditch, dragging him underneath the vehicle to which Grant suffers a terrible injury leading to his death. As said, the sole witness to this incident was his father, Aaron Solomon. But it's more complicated than just that, of course. Aaron says there were three other guys there at the scene trying to help him and his son. But this is after Grant and the truck are already in the ditch. And the truck is on top of Grant. As we keep pointing out, this story is quite complicated. But I think we should start with the morning in question and then just take it from there. Right. So we are going to go back just three years ago, to what looks to be a very nice place to live, work, and raise a family. This is Gallatin, Tennessee. Gallatin is a city located in Sumner County, Tennessee, with a population of a little more than 44,000 people, this according to the 2020 census. The city was established on the Cumberland River and is the county seat of Sumner County. Gallatin is northeast of one of our favorite cities, Nashville, Tennessee. This is a safe city, a low crime area with crime rates well below the U.S. national average. The morning in question is July 20th, 2020. This is a Monday. The location of the incident is the Ward Performance Institute at 1357 South Water Avenue in Gallatin. This is a baseball training facility where Grant Solomon was attending this event that, that's labeled as an evaluation of his skills in a practice session. Now, on this morning, accompanying him would be his father. We do need to point out that it's well reported that this is going to be the first time in two years that the two would be alone together somewhere, going together just the two of them without 
Sister Gracie or anybody else present. There are plenty of people that are saying Grant was not looking forward to this event. Some have said it's because his father would be there. Some have said it's because his father insisted that he go to this event. These type of events, though, are important to go to if you are hoping to get into a Division I school or play sports at the next level. We should also point out, though, here and remind everybody, if you've forgotten, shame on you, but this is COVID. This is the height of COVID as well. And so if there was going to be a situation where Grant was hoping to testify against his father in court, I don't think that this was going to come anytime soon as the court systems in many areas had shut down. Right. And I'm actually a little surprised that this event was going on in July, but you know, every area handled this pandemic differently. We don't know the exact situation. This could be, could be a a very one-on-one type of situation. What we do know though, is that Grant himself did get COVID and was recovering. He's, he's over it by this point. But he's recovering, and some say that he was not looking forward to going to this event less because of his father and more because he wasn't 100% yet and ready to perform at what needs to be a high level, especially if he's being evaluated by other people. Yeah, it makes me wonder why his father had to be there or if he even had to be there. I'm I'm wondering if this type of event, if it was through the NCAA do they, do they make you have a, a a guardian with you? Yes, that's a good question. If you have to have a parent with you. The other thing, too, is he's 18, so I don't know if that plays a major role. But it, it looks to me, okay, let's take the alleged abuse aside. Right. And we, we, have to, we have to be fair going into this and maintain that it is alleged abuse for now. We can examine this, but with my own eyes, I've not witnessed any of this or any portions of this true crime story. So it's alleged abuse. But the other reports is that, of course, Aaron Solomon, a very controlling father, very controlling parent, especially when it came to Grant and his athletics and his schooling. And therefore, it may be a situation, Captain, where parent is not required but Aaron insists on being there or Aaron paid for this evaluation practice session. Right. Because these things are typically not cheap. You'd think that his father would want some separation from his son that is making allegations against him. Many of his friends and family, this is Grant's family and friends, believe that Grant was murdered on this morning. And that his suspicious death is, as some believe, an attempt by that father to silence Grant's allegations of Aaron's sexual abuse against Grant's sister, Gracie, in an upcoming court proceedings. What I don't have a great understanding of, Captain, everybody keeps mentioning this Grant is going to testify against his father or Grant was hoping to go to the courts and get custody of his sister or that maybe after he testifies against his father, custody would finally be granted to his mother, Angie. What I couldn't sort out was if that court date was actually scheduled, right? Because we already pointed out that it was COVID. A lot of the courts had shut down or some of them were starting to open back up and do Zoom proceedings. We can have the reports that he was going to testify against his father. We can have the reports that he was going to seek custody of his little sister what i don't have reports of is that an actual court date was set for those proceedings now this is a catastrophic incident as said it takes place at the ward performance institute at 1357 south water avenue in gallatin this is a baseball training facility where grant was attending as an evaluation of his skills, and it's a it's also a practice session. And he seems to be playing at a higher level, so if there were other young athletes there, I'm guessing that they are on his level, more so on his level, that this might not be something that just anybody can walk into. As said, accompanying him was his father, and this would be the first time that the two would be together or, or alone 
at any time. It's reported that that it's two years by this time, and that that seems crazy to me, but that's the report. Okay, so just to be clear, Grant is going to this training facility to get evaluated to possibly play baseball on the next level. His father is going to attend this event with him, and do we know if they rode together or if they drove separately? What's great about this case is that a lot of the information that is out there, it's, it's well documented and it's well presented to the public. And so we have some very official reports to reference in this case, which we don't get that in some of the cases, but this case, because it's so recent again, just three years ago, let's start by going through those official reports. So the first one that we're going to review, Captain, is a written statement by the father, Aaron Solomon, after the air quotes accident. This is the written statement that he provides to the police officer on the scene that day. And it gives all of your pertinent information that you would expect about the person giving the statement. We don't need to go through that. But his statement, handwritten, says, my son Grant and I pulled into WPI separately, parked side by side. I was still in my car, but noticed my son got out to get his baseball gear out of the back of his truck. Remember, Grant is driving a pickup truck. Goes on to say, I look down to check a work email, and the next thing I know, I hear and see the truck rolling backwards into the ditch. I get out of my car to try to find my son, and I saw that he was trapped underneath the truck and immediately called 911. So this is where it makes it a little tricky because it's like, well, did his father have to attend, or is his father just attending and saying, hey, I'm I'm your father, I'm going to attend this event no matter if you want me to or not. But they're at this event, they're in the parking lot. I'm guessing there's other individuals parked in this lot. According to the statement and according to what the next statement that we will get to, it, the unfortunate part of this, Captain, of course, is the, the horrible accident or the whole, the whole situation in general. But the added factor is that according to these reports and according to people that are trying to put together some form of investigation on this incident – there's not anybody else that seems to have 100% witnessed the situation themselves other than Grant's father, Aaron. And by his own statement, it seems like he's missing part of the story too. He looks down to check an email on his phone. And then next thing he knows, he, he, he realizes the truck is moving backwards. Right. They're parked on an incline and we'll get to, accident scene photos and evaluation and examine those here in a minute, but they're parked on an incline right up against the facility, right next to the building itself, side by side. And according to his statement, he looks down to check his email. He knows his son's already out of his truck, goes to the rear of the truck to retrieve his baseball bag and other equipment from the back of the truck, from the bed of the truck, and then realizes Oh snap, the truck is moving backwards. He gets out and does not see his son. And then realizing truck in the ditch, my kid is underneath the truck. So we have a, we have a typed statement from the responding officer. And from my understanding, captain, once Aaron calls 911. Aaron Aaron is the first and only person to call 911 in this situation. And police are on the scene relatively quickly. But keep in mind it it's a Monday morning. It's busy rush hour traffic, people driving off to work. And that's where the lack of eyewitnesses even after the truck is in the ditch are few and far between. It's pretty slim here, but we do have these air quotes, official reports. So this report from the officer says on July 20th, 2020 at eight 43 AM, I was dispatched to the 
the location that we've been discussing, discussing for an injury crash. I arrived on scene and found a male subject that was trapped under his vehicle in a rocky ditch area. Sumner County EMS and Gallatin Fire Department were already on scene attempting to get the male subject out. I spoke with the father of the male subject, and he was identified as Mr. Aaron Solomon. Mr. Solomon stated that he was meeting his son Grant at the facility and that he had arrived there first. Mr. Solomon stated that he was sitting in his vehicle when Grant pulled in next to him in his white pickup truck. Mr. Solomon stated that he observed Grant get out of the truck and walk towards the back door area. Mr. Solomon stated that he then noticed that the truck was no longer parked beside him and he started to get out and look and heard a loud crash and observed Grant's truck had rolled down the hill and into the ditch. Mr. Solomon stated that he went over to the area of the truck and observed Grant under the vehicle. Mr. Solomon stated that he called 911 at that time and attempted to help his son. Mr. Solomon was able to get me information on his son and he contacted Grant's mother and notified her of the situation. I gathered a written statement from Mr. Solomon and he was released from the scene to go to Sumner Regional. That's the hospital where Grant was transferred to. I was not able to locate any other witnesses to the crash. I spoke with the gym employees and asked about camera footage and they stated that they did not have any cameras on the outside of the building that would have gotten video of the incident. I turned the written statement and all other information over to MPO Wilson. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and let's unpack that after a quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we're faced with a crossroads in life, and we don't know which path to take. Maybe you're thinking about a career change or feeling like your relationship needs some TLC. Whatever it is, therapy can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find the way forward. Throughout times in my life, I've felt that therapy is right for me. And while I was a little apprehensive at first, each and every time I have found therapy to be an enlightening and positive experience. If you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Get ready for the best school year yet with IXL, the ultimate online learning program for K-12. Whether it's homework help, grade improvement, or conquering new challenges, IXL guides your child every step of the way. IXL makes learning fun and engaging, and it's less than $10 per month. Say goodbye to costly tutoring. IXL provides comprehensive support at unbeatable value. Membership start at just $9.95 per month. Visit IXL.com today for an exclusive 20% off. Unlock your child's full potential. Visit IXL.com now. Cheers to you, Captain, and cheers to the people in the back. Real quick, I want to tell everybody about our good friends over at Law & Crime. Law & Crime, the live trial streaming company behind the Depp, Murdaugh, and Paltrow trials, has a great daily true crime podcast called Law & Crime Sidebar. It's unbiased true crime analysis from two of Law & Crime's most respected reporters in 20 minutes or less. Law and Crime Sidebar dives deep into the biggest true crime stories every Monday through Friday. The podcast also recaps the nation's biggest trials everyone is talking about. They take you inside the courtroom, break down key moments, 
wins from both sides, sentencing and victim impact statements. Listen to Law and Crime Sidebar every Monday through Friday on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Make sure you check out our friends at Law and Crime and their podcast, Law and Crime Sidebar. All right, we are back, ladies and gents. Cheers to you all. Thank you guys so much for buying t-shirts and keeping the lights on in the True Crime Garage Studios. Cheers to you, Captain. Now, I'm going to just play devil's advocate here for a second as we go through this. If you're going to attack your son to shut him up about these allegations of abuse towards him and his sister, sexual and physical and other types of abuse, you probably won't do that in a public location. Also, a location that you don't know if they have security footage and also probably in a location, a public location that you don't know if they have security footage or not. And you're not in the vehicle with your son going to the facility, so you don't have any control on where he parks his vehicle. I agree with every one of those statements. The takeaway, though, would be that one This may have been something that Aaron is considering in silencing his son, but it it also could be something that was rather impromptu. It wasn't planned or wasn't planned for this day at this moment. They haven't seen each other in two years, or, or I shouldn't say that. They've seen each other in the past two years. They've not been alone right in the past two years. And if Grant is a threat to his father, by all these reports, it sounds like he's not legally a threat to his father until he turned 18, which is like a month and seven days before this incident. So where I'm, where I'm going with this captain is that this could be something that just, they arrive, they see each other, they're in the parking lot, having a conversation that starts to get nasty at some point, And maybe one person did something that wasn't planned. Maybe wasn't even something that they would do had they been able to keep their cool, but somebody did something and then had to find a way to cover it up. Right. So I, I agree with everything that you're saying. This is not like, this is not the ideal place to ambush somebody. Yeah. And we're going to get into some medical reports as well, right? Yes, we have, again, we have very official reports here. Some of the, the medical stuff, the, the report from the police officer that we just went through, but more importantly, we have the accident scene photographs before we get to that though, let's play that nine one one call. I'm trying. Where's your emergency? It's 1357 South water street. It's, off 109, please hurry. You said 57? Please hurry. Okay, what's 13, going on? 57. Uh, my, my son's truck backed over him, and he, it's rolled over him and dragged him into the ditch, and it's on top of him. He's trapped under the truck, and I... I yeah, he... So I, he uh, somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to no. I'm I'm trying to call nine one one. Okay, what's your name? Oh my god. My name is Aaron Solomon. And you said oh you're at thirteen fifty seven South Water Avenue, right? Yes. How old yes. is the male? He's eighteen. He just turned eighteen a couple of weeks, about a month ago. It's my son. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is not good. Is he awake? Can oh, talk please to hurry. You? I don't know. I don't think so. He's not. Uh, he's not alert, right? No, he's out, and he's trapped. I got three guys here, and he's trapped under the truck. Okay. Oh my God. I understand, sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. All right, Aaron. Huh? What kind of vehicle is it? 
it's a Toyota Tacoma, Tacoma, and it the the vehicle has to, he's underneath the vehicle. Okay, I've got and the, that. And, and it's, okay, I've got that. What color is it? It's a white truck. That's my son. He, it's somehow it backed up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on one. I'm on with nine one one right now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Was your son working on it? No, no, he was just getting out of it. It's the hill. It's we're on an incline, and I guess he didn't have it in park or something, or it wasn't engaged, or. Oh my God! Oh my God! I can't believe this. Is your son still not responding? No, no. And he's still under truck. No one can get out from under it. No, it's no. We've got units and routes to you. I'm just asking you questions for we can update him, okay? Can you check and see if he's breathing? I, I, somebody's telling me that he's coming too. Okay. Maybe. He's waking up. Maybe. kind of keeping still. So he is well, he can't, Yeah, he can't move. I don't think he can move. I, I don't know. Okay. I no, he can't move. He's trapped. Okay. Well, we got somebody in route. Now, when he wakes uh, up, he might I'm be scared. I'm telling him, Can somebody I'm get down him. there and talk to him? Yeah, somebody talk to him. There. Shit. Yeah. Gee, there's blood. Wait, is he facing up or down? He's facing up. They said he may aspirate. We need to hurry. Oh my God! So does he have blood coming out of his mouth? Yeah, he's, yeah. There's blood coming out. Yeah, somehow it drug him down. I think I don't know whether it wasn't in park or what, or if it didn't engage the brake, or it drug him underneath somehow. Okay. They said he's facing up. Okay. But he's bleeding from his mouth. So. Grant, turn your face to the side if you can, barely, but be careful. Don't move him, okay? We can't move him. We can't. We can't move him. Oh my God. All right, these and they're there. I'm gonna let you go, okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Bye bye. I always find the 911 calls to be very fascinating. Yes, I do as well, Captain. I think that they're they're often fascinating. And but I'm always like pulled to one side of the conversation where I'm like, I get they're asking a whole lot of questions, just hurry up and get here. You know, I know in some areas they have the ability to once emergency personnel has been dispatched to then continue on with the call and then play the call over the radio for the persons responding to the scene, which is all, always very interesting and very cool because then you know that they're, they should be getting firsthand knowledge of what the scene is, what it looks like prior to arriving. And right. so you're able to jump out of your, your fire truck or your ambulance and, and get right into action and get right to the scene. You know, it seems like such a silly question to say, well, what color is the truck? Well, you, you sit there. If if you're an emergency and if that's your son, you're you're sitting there thinking, who cares, lady? Like it, it could be right. purple for all for all I care. But but no, it's you know, as you pointed out earlier, Captain, this is not a busy parking lot, and we only know that based off of the the officer's statement and Aaron's statement as well. But had it been a busy parking lot, just something as simple as knowing the color of the truck may save the responders 20 seconds, 30 seconds. These could be life-saving seconds. Yeah, and I, I just want to set up this scenario clear for the listener. We have a son that is going to a athletic facility for some a training session where he's going to be evaluated. He... He pulls up into that parking lot. His father pulls up beside him. He gets out to get his equipment. Somehow, this truck backs up over him. He is now in the ditch. This is what what his father is saying. He's now in the ditch with 
the truck on top of him. Now the father is saying that there's three other men at the scene trying to help. He's calling 911. It seems as if the father is talking to somebody and you know, I can't make out what they're saying, but to me it sounds like whoever he's talking to, not the dispatcher, but whoever's there with him at the scene, that you can actually hear them responding. Does that make any sense? Well, this to me, this is one of the most difficult parts of this case to examine because there are a lot of people out there that say this is all a farce, that 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 these people, they weren't really there, uh, that Aaron made them up, he's acting. There are other people, too, that are saying, you know, clearly he's making no sense on purpose on the 911 call. I think those people need to take another listen to the call because he's either actually talking to other people that are there. It's not that he's not making sense. He's talking to more than just right. the 911 or emergency personnel that answered the phone. And that's clear. He's having multiple conversations. Just the only other conversation that's being recorded is that with the emergency personnel. Right. But I'm just saying my ears, I'm, I'm asking you a question. My ears when he's talking to somebody, quote unquote, in real life, that I'm hearing some kind of response from them. Like I hear somebody, there's there there's other voices on this phone call. And I'm glad to sit here and listen to it with you because you, you play the engineer role on the show. Why? Because of many reasons. But one of those reasons is you have a much better ear for this sort of thing than, than I do. In fact, you have much better ear than 98% of the, the world's population. Yeah. And that's been tested. It's we, that's been proven. Time I once and time again. drove with my father to Those a are facility. Facts. Those are facts. Yes. And we tested. Now the thing here is I don't know if I had to lean one way or the other, I'm with you that I believe that I hear some kind of response or there's something in the background when he's talking, clearly talking to somebody that's not being recorded. Okay. But if I had to lean one way, that's the way I go, but I don't feel so strong or confident about that statement. Okay. But what we do here on the 911 cause, we hear the ambulance come. Yes. Yes. Or, sir. or some people would call it a ambulance, ambulance or the fire truck. We know that the, according to the officer's statement, the EMS and fire department personnel were already on the scene when the police arrived. Right. So they would be able to tell us if there was other individuals at the scene. Here's the problem. All right. Here's the so pro here's the problem with the well, ambulance. Well, there's going to be, there. there's a lot of problems when trying to investigate this case because we have one side telling us this is what happened. It's a cover up. It's, it's a stage scene. This is a murder. We have the other side saying this is an accident and these other people are, these allegations are, are crazy. The situation, as I understand it, captain is this, according to the officer, what he said, I could find no other eyewitnesses. The officer per his statement, couldn't find the three people that were there when he arrives on the scene. Now, Anybody that's been trying to assist in an accident or witnessed an accident uh, or, or even a, a crime, we all know that typically what happens is people rush to try to help. And then once the, the appropriate people are there, the people that are, that know what they're doing, the first responders, right. the experts, once they're there, the people that showed up to help, they kind of leave at that time. Or, well, but also, or the officer or EMT or somebody will say, you know, we need you to kind of clear out of this area. We, you know, let us do our thing. Yeah. And we also know that there are people there. There's probably a time frame that you have to be there at this athletic facility to perform and to be evaluated. So these people that might have stopped to help, they might have an appointment to go inside. So when they go, hey, the, the ambulance came and the firefighters are here and they got this under control, we're going inside. 
Yeah, the the other thing too to keep in mind though, with it being the the COVID year, they may be doing these evaluations and the practices more one on one. Well, that's and, yeah, and, and, and but that's what and, I'm saying. But everybody would have like an appointment time and staggering these throughout the day. And we do have the officer statement that he receives the call at eight thirty seven a.m. So there's a chance that that um, Grant's appointment would have been the first of the day, mm-hmm. which would make sense when you see the the accident scene photos where there just appears to be no other vehicles in the parking lot other than emergency personnel. And the thing here is too, like, so this, this is why I'm, I'm trying, I have to stay water in this situation. This is a very fluid situation. Stay water, examine each situation as we go through it, the evidence as we go through it and not to lean one side or the other prior to, to looking at any of this information that we have to review. So the thing is, Yes, I'm with you. If I had to pick a side, I believe that he is talking to somebody. So that would imply, yes, there were these three other people or two other people. He references three in the 911 call, he being Aaron, the father. Right. We at least know that there's, uh, look, I I can lean towards the idea there as at least one other individual there. The problem then becomes this. Those persons, just because they're there during the 911 call, does not mean that they witnessed any portion of this accident. Right. It only means that they stopped to help after they see a big white truck in a ditch right next to a busy road. We don't, per the officer's statement, have any other eyewitnesses. Well, and the other problem, too, with without having these eyewitness statements, we don't know if the father tried to flag down individuals to get help. Right. And here becomes the problem later when the people are saying the side that says this is intentional homicide, when they are asking for these three people to come forward that were there, that we say that we believe we can hear them responding to Aaron Solomon. It's my understanding, captain, those people have never come forward. They got, they have no dog in the fight. Why wouldn't they come forward and say, this is what I witnessed. This was my experience while I was there. I saw a father that was panicking and wanting to try to get his son to safety or, or the reverse. I saw a guy that didn't seem to care about what was going on and nobody, you know, other, other than me and these other two guys that were trying to help, this guy was kind of just hanging out. The, the, the thing that I want to sort out here is why is what is clear that I can tell from him talking to the emergency personnel, the father, yeah, and to the supposed three guys that are there. He's not down in the ditch. If those other three guys are there, he's not down in the ditch. You can what again, the, the interaction between the father and. And the three guys that are there to help, it seems to be that they are relaying information to him that he is then in turn telling to emergency services. And I want to know why is he not down in that ditch? Is is it as simple as he couldn't get a signal down there? Or maybe his phone was in his vehicle. So when they said, hey, call 911, he had to get out of the ditch, go back up to his vehicle. And maybe he's not thinking clearly because... This is a panic situation. Yeah. But we all know the simplicity of it is if you can be there with the person that needs help, that is the quickest way to get information to the people that can offer help is to be right next to that person. And unless you cannot communicate with emergency personnel and be next to the person, that that's the only explanation of why this man wouldn't be down in the ditch with the truck and with his son. Well, I also think these quote unquote eyewitnesses that have never come forward. One, maybe it's because they're coming from a faraway land to go to these uh, this tryout, this evaluation. It could be a, a regional tryout. These guys could be from you know a couple but- hours away. Right, and it's difficult to say who these people are without them coming forward. But I, I want to make something clear before we go too far down this road. It, it, if these people do exist, 
it's my understanding that they are they are passer buyers that stopped because they right, they, they were, saw yeah these are people that should have been just driving to and from work it's 8 30 in the morning right these weren't individuals no because they that, would have stuck around and the police officer who was there within minutes would have interviewed them uh, yeah because they could have went into the facility and said hey Right. The only person that the officer says he was able to speak with are two guys that were working in the gym. They're working in the the facility that that Grant was supposed to go to to attend this this session. Now I'm going to I'm going to go to the other side. Like I said, I was playing devil's advocate. Now I got to come back to this other side. A big uh, question for me is. I'm the father. I pull into a parking spot. I check my phone. I look up. My son's car has now backed up. I get out of my vehicle. I see that the vehicle has somehow dragged and trapped my son under the, under the car. Mm -hmm. Right then I'm making the phone call. If I make it a 911 call right away, right when there is an emergency, there is nobody at the scene at that time. There was no eyewitnesses because they wouldn't have had time to get there and to be in that ditch helping my son when I made that call. Does that make sense? No. What I'm saying is if if the way he's telling the story, if it happened the way he told the story, that instantly when he looked back, once he gets out of that vehicle and he sees his son underneath that car, that's the moment you're calling 911. Correct. And all I'm saying is I don't think that would have gave enough time for a on like a, a passerby a passerbyer to see that there was an emergency and to drive their vehicle around, get out of their vehicle and get into a ditch by the time I made that call. Exactly. And that's why I asked the question earlier of, I want to know why he's not down in the ditch with his son. Because if, if he goes down there, as he says in his statement, I got out of my vehicle only to go and find the, the truck in the ditch and my son underneath. Is he trying to call 911 and he can't, he he can't get a signal for whatever reason. And so he runs back. If anybody bothers to, so if you go to, freedom gracie.com you can see the accident photos that were taken that day there on this website and you will see very clearly why it makes sense that the truck would go and roll down the hill i when when i first started looking at this case i had made the assumption that we were probably talking about a five speed manual transmission and that maybe he just didn't put it into park. Now, it, I later learned that this was an automatic transmission, but that still could be the case. According to several people, and unfortunately Grant is not here for us to ask him, but according to several people, Grant was nervous about going to Gallatin that day, possibly nervous about being alone with his father, even if it's just for minutes. And maybe in his nervousness, he failed to put the vehicle into park and left it in neutral does not set the parking brake. He's parked on an incline goes around to the back of the truck. The truck starts to move backwards, topples over top of him, dragging him down into the ditch. That is not an improbable situation. That is not a highly unlikely situation, but what people will point out is some of the other evidence. When you get into the details does not line up with him with, with the truck causing his death. Yeah. So sticking with the nine one one call, I don't know if I hear much acting. I mean, there's a couple of times where he's going, you know, you know, please hurry or like, Oh my God. Or so, so maybe there's a little bit of that going on, but, uh, for the most part, it's like I don't I don't know if this his I don't know if his response to the dispatcher leans one way or the other uh, a situation where he's trying to cover up a situation where the father is trying to cover it up or is it just a situation that w- it was a horrible accident 
Yeah, it's often, I find it rather difficult. And I know that a lot of people think, oh man, you can hear it in that person's voice. I, I don't want to sit here and pretend that for for one second. We listen to a lot of these 911 calls. We play a lot of the 911 calls when we examine these cases. And look, the majority of the time, I can't, f- from the sound, from the tone, to the words that the caller is saying, determine if a person is guilty or innocent. There are those rare occasions that it's it's quite obvious right. which way to lean, but not knowing Aaron Solomon, not not having had conversations with him, not not knowing his life experiences, it's very difficult to say is this man acting or is this j- just a guy who this is how he responds or this is he's in panic mode and he's not He's not his normal self. One thing we should point out, though, the, to people that are not familiar with this case, is Aaron Solomon is he worked professionally at a at a rather high level as a news anchor for at least fifteen years. And so, where some people may not have taken drama classes or public speaking courses or any of those things, I would assume he's educated in that realm. And so if somebody would have the ability to put on a front to play a part, he might possess that, that ability to do so. Well, and let me just point this out though, too, because like I said, I hear somebody in the background. I'm going to assume that there's, those are some eyewitnesses or people that are trying to help. So with a lot of these other 911 calls, when you look at, you know, the, the um, when you look at like the Scott Pearson 911 call or you, you look at some of these other 911 calls, they're calling 911 and they are by themselves. So it, to me, it'd be a little bit easier to go, okay, I need to call 911 and I need to put on this show that I'm freaked out, right? A little bit harder to do if you have other people at that scene. The thing here for me with in re- regard to the 911 call and to forming a strong opinion about that 911 call, two things. Two bits of information that are missing that I think are key players in this situation one why is he not in the ditch with the sun and he's he's up in the the parking lot and we know this based off of of several statements that are given but also the his interaction with those people the three guys that are here helping me and his his conversation with emergency personnel he's not in the ditch with his son i need to know the answer to that question is it because he could not get a signal is it because he was just panicking, did not know what to do? The other bit of information that is missing here, too, is what time was Grant's appointment? Right. Because we know that the officer saying, I got a call, an emergency call at 837. Well, if Grant's appointment was 830, it seems like there might have been enough time for something to happen to something to go down in that parking lot or, or near that facility, an argument to take place between father and son, an argument that leads to violence between father and son. There would be, there seems like there would be time for that. If the appointments at nine, they're arriving early to me, that changes the totality of the evidence. I, the, those I think are are bits of information that are lacking here that that should be included in this story. Again, my humble garage opinion, like you like to say, is I I think there's some kind of evidence that shows that this nine one one call wasn't made immediately. Exactly. That's that's what I'm saying. I think that if we had those answers to those two questions, we could we could better form an opinion on that that regard
want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage. Until tomorrow. Be good, be kind, and don't let it. Thank you.